Well, I was, uh, I told the kids we went to parent-teacher conferences this week, and uh, we always like to go and figure out how things are going for our kids. We usually have a pretty good idea, but we went, and I remember we were sitting down um, at the sixth grade, you know, in the middle school, you just show up, and they're all there in the gym, and you find your teacher, and you go sit down with them, and whenever they're free, and then you can go to their other teachers, the specials, and all the other things, and so we're doing that, and, I, and we're sitting down talking, and there's always this conversation that happens when we go to conferences, especially at the middle school. And it's this, it's this thing that happens between my wife and the teacher, where they have both this like mutual respect and I don't know how you do what you do kind of conversation with each other. Katie teaches kindergarten, and sixth grade teachers teach sixth grade. And they both sit there and like, I do not know how you teach that age group. And I was thinking as we were t- kind of talking about it at this, at this conference, you know, I love, I, I really enjoy teenagers, and I think I could have taught in middle school. Like, I think that would have been kindergarten, absolutely not. Not even close. But like middle school, high school, I think that would have been a very cool thing. And, and you know, and I would have enjoyed that kind of, of a job that kind of, a, of work, that kind of, uh, of thing, but I couldn't because I was called somewhere else. And I thought about all the people that I know that work in all sorts of different places, you know, teachers and, and all sorts of different areas of work, and, and seeing the calling that God is, is putting on people's lives in the places that they are. It got me back to where we are today. Rochelle read for us from 1 Samuel this great story about Samuel. He's a kid, but before that, his mom did one of those things where she made a deal with God. We often in troubling times kind of do that, and we're like, okay, God, if you will only deal with this, I will do whatever. And um, then typically, no matter what happens, we don't do whatever we said that we would do. But, he, you know, sometimes it goes our way from his end, but we don't tend to go through with it. Well, Samuel's mom, Hannah, was barren. She was unable to have kids. She wanted a son, so she said to God, if you would give me a son, I will give him back to you. And then the craziest thing happens. God gives her a son, and Hannah gives him back. Takes him and commits him to the temple where he, he's going to learn under Eli, the priest. So now Samuel's 12 years old or so. And he serves Eli, and at night, as Rochelle read to us, each night, he, each time he kept waking up, somebody's calling my name. And he'd run to Eli, and he said, no, it wasn't me, go lay back down, you're having a dream. And he heard it again, and he ran. Finally, Eli realized that the voice he's hearing is the voice of God, and so prepare yourself, go, and when you hear it again, say, Lord, your servant is listening. And Samuel did. I think about calling. We talk about it a lot in the church. We talk about being called into ministry. We talk about being called to missions when somebody feels called to go overseas and work in the mission fields. We talk about calling because instead of setting a long resume in in this life with Christ, what is most important is that we hear his voice and respond. We started a series last week on the letter to the Galatians that we're calling Which Gospel? And the reason is because Paul's talking to, to uh, excuse me, the church that is, is dealing with um, figuring out what's going on with the gospel among Jews and Greeks. And so last week we looked at how Paul came out, and he came out kind of angry, uh, astonished, he said, at the gospel that you're teaching, which is not the gospel that we have taught you. And he says, which gospel are you going to teach? Because what you're saying is that anybody that wants to follow Jesus has to also follow the Jewish law, and that's not the gospel of Jesus. So today we're continuing in Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 11. And it starts almost like a, a resume mixed with a testimony. He starts talking about who he is and what he's doing um, and why he, he is, is able to write this letter to them. And what it comes down to is a calling 
that is clear in Paul's life. Galatians 1 verse 11 says this. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you've heard from my previous way of life in Judaism how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I, you, I assure you before God that what I'm writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized I had been in trust with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should remember, continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. Okay, so that's a lot. But here's what Paul is doing. He says, here's what I'm, here's what I'm coming to you. I'm not bringing to you some kind of message that I was taught or that I learned from somebody else or some, some person gave to me. I'm bringing you the gospel that was given, given to me by God himself. And if you remember, Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, had this encounter with him that left him blind until he met with Ananias. And, and from that encounter, he went straight into the following and the sharing of the gospel. So he, he comes out to say, I, the reason I can come to you is because, not just because of who I was as this, I, you know, I was educated, I was zealous, I was doing all the things that my fathers would have wanted me to do to the point of persecuting God's people in, in followers of Jesus. He says, God got a hold of me and called me to something new. And immediately, that's what I did. So he begins his ministry by following a calling that comes from God. Now, being called is something that I think God has for each one of us. The difficulty is figuring out exactly what that is. Now, I would love if God would be super clear in his call all the time. So like, you know, imagine being Samuel and laying in bed and having this voice so pronounced that three times I woke up and went and asked somebody what was going on. Like, I would be all in for that kind of a call. Like, God, because after he said, yes, I'm listening, God, like, told him what was to come. 
what he needed to do. And it wasn't all good news, but it was certainly God's plan for him. Like I would totally take God full on talking so that I knew exactly what he wanted me to do. Or I would be okay, as long as it was temporary like Paul, I would be okay with the Damascus Road experience. Like I'm going on my way, God appears, bright light, it's very obvious, it's totally Jesus. I could be blind for a couple days. Like whatever where it's clear that God is calling me to do his will. But today, we have the Holy Spirit within us when we know Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is at work in us, and I believe that, that daily He is calling us, He is leading us, and sometimes I have found that I am terrible at listening. And so I would really appreciate this like audible or blinding light kind of experience with God. And that just isn't the way it has worked for me. But it doesn't change it that God is calling. God called Paul, and Paul began to teach immediately the good news of Jesus. The good news that God sent his son to come and to, to reconcile us with God through the forgiveness of sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. And that calling gave him the authority Paul, because God met him and called him, he had the authority to come not only to go and to preach, but also to write this letter and say, hey, we got to make sure that what you're doing is the right thing. His calling gave him authority. I read this story about this uh, former governor in Massachusetts. His name was Christian Herter. And he was running for a second term in office. So he's he's the governor, and he's he's running for a second term, and he... He's doing all this campaigning, and so he's out campaign, campaigning, going, going door to door, doing all this stuff. Gets to about lunchtime, and he's starving. I mean, he hasn't eaten in, in, all morning, and he sees a church barbecue and decides to go by the church barbecue and get some food. So he gets in line, he gets his plate, and he's going through the line, and he gets up there, and um, the lady that is serving the chicken puts one piece of chicken on his plate. And he says, excuse me, do you mind if I have another piece of chicken she says, sorry, I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. Well, governor said, but I'm starving. Could I just have one more piece of chicken? And she said, this is what I've been told to do. I can't give you two pieces of chicken. Now, he was a pretty humble guy, so he wasn't the kind of people that walked around telling everybody who he was. But he said, in this one instance, I'm going to throw my weight around a little bit. And he said, excuse me, do you know who I am? I am the governor of this state. And her response was, do you know who I am? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along, mister. I would love to be that lady in that line. To have the guts to do that. But the authority that Paul had was the authority that was given by God in, in his calling. That he could come and he could, he could preach the gospel. He didn't go straight to the apostles and say, hey, I think God's telling me to do this, but I'm not quite sure. Can you guys make sure that I'm, I'm okay with this? No, he, he heard it, he met Jesus, and he went. But later he came back. We also see that our calling is not just between me and Jesus, but it's seen uh, in, in my actions and by others. So, so while Paul went and he preached, he also came back, and there's this point where he comes back and he meets with Peter, and, and he, he says, I wanted to make sure that the gospel I was preaching was right. He said, I didn't want to be running my race in vain. I wanted, them to, I wanted to make sure that the other apostles understood and agreed with what I was doing. And at one point he says, Barnabas and I came, and, and, and Peter and... And John, they gave us the right hand of fellowship, and they said, yes, go and preach that gospel to the Gentiles. We're going to preach the gospel to the Jews, and, and we are doing what God is wanting us to do. Because though calling gives us authority, just as it did Paul, it's affirmed by other people. Reminds us that we are not alone in this, that we need other people to help us to recognize what God is doing in us. So Paul uses this kind of a, as he's introducing his letter to the, 
to the Galatians. He's using this to kind of give, give himself a foothold to speak into their church. You know, this is who I am. And it's not because of what I've done or because what I learned from somebody or, or some tradition, but this is who I am because God has called me and then his people, his apostles have affirmed me and therefore I am speaking out of that authority. So here's the thing. I think, uh, I think God is calling each of us. And we may not do what Paul did, but he, he's calling each of us and he wants to give us that, that authority, that affirmation, that opportunity to, to work in his kingdom for his good. And his Holy Spirit comes into us and guides us, but we've got to be listening. And I think though I would love that Damascus Road type of experience, the reality is I have experienced the Spirit's guidance multiple times throughout my life. And I can tell you there's been several where I've heard it and I've ignored it because I wasn't quite willing to go there. I remember one particular one and I mean, it was such a small thing, but um, years ago, our Walmart had a separate space for like cell phone. You could go get a new phone, a new plan through whatever company. And I would go in there just because I'm a nerd and I like phones. And so I'd go in and I'd talk to the workers and Katie would make fun of me and go somewhere else. But um, I'd go in there and I'd just talk to them about the new phones that were out, you know, and we'd chat about, about technology. And I remember one time I went in there and I'm just chatting with this guy and somehow he goes from talking about the new phone to like his life. He's talking about a relationship that he's in. And he's talking about kind of struggling with it. And, and I swear I felt a nudge that this was supposed to be something bigger than it was. You know, this was not really about cell phones. And I kept it at arm's length. I continued the small talk and I got the heck out of there. And I remember thinking later, the spirit was moving for something bigger and I just wasn't paying attention. I think it happens to us all the time because we'd much rather God just say something out loud or catch us with a bright light when he's working in us in everyday moments. We just have to listen. There's a story I, I, I want to tell you that is old. Uh, it's one I heard all the time growing up. By, uh, from Tony Campolo, who I grew up on Tony Campolo stories. And uh, he tells this story about, uh, about going to preach at a Pentecostal college. And he's going to preach at their chapel service. And so before the service, they decided they were going to pray for him to prepare him for preaching. And so he goes and they have him get down on his knees and they all put their hands on his head. They're Pentecostal, so they like pray bigger than we do typically and longer. And so they put their hands on his head and, and start praying for him. And he said the more they got into it, they, like harder they pushed on his head. And there was one guy that just kept saying, do you feel the spirit? Do you feel the spirit? And he's like, I don't know that I feel the spirit, but I feel like a crick in the back of my neck because you are shoving me down into the ground. And there was this one guy, so they're praying for him and they're, you know, they just keep going on and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and they're pushing on him more and more. And there's this one guy that keeps praying for some guy named Charlie Stoltzfus. And he's like, this is weird because the whole point of this is they're praying for me to preach. And two, if you're going to shove my head, at least pray for me. Don't pray for some other guy that you're thinking of. But this guy just kept going on. Uh, Lord, be with Charlie Stoltzfus. He's going to leave his wife and his kids. And he just, he can't do that. Lord, bring an angel to, to keep him at his house. Don't let him leave his family. You know, Lord, Charlie Stoltzfus, he lives just down the road in that silver mobile home on the right. Lord, and, he, and Tony's like, seriously? God needs his address, you know, he doesn't know where he is. So he sits there and he hears him pray about him oh, all, all through this. Finally, they finish and he goes and he preaches in the, in the chapel. When he's done, he goes to leave. And uh, he gets in his car, he's heading home, he's, uh, this is in Pennsylvania. And he sees this young man who's hitchhiking on the side of the road, so he just pulls over and, and the guy gets in and Tony introduces himself. He says, hi, my name is Tony Campolo. And the man replied, my name is Charlie Stoltzfus. So Tony is driving down the road. As soon as he hears his name, he gets off and he turns around and he starts going the other way. And the guy kind of starts looking at him funny. He says, what are you doing? And he says, uh, I'm taking you home. You're leaving your wife and kids, right? 
And the guy's eyes got as big as saucers, of course, and just stared at him. So Tony starts driving him home. And as he does, like, this guy gets so far over to the right, he's, like, in the door, staring at Tony. And as he's driving, he pulls directly up to the silver mobile home on the right, pulls into the driveway, and he says, go inside, tell your wife, I'm going to come in and we're going to talk. So the guy runs inside ahead of him, he gets his wife, she comes out, her eyes are as big as saucers. Tony goes in and he says, listen, uh, I want you to sit down and I'm going to talk and you're going to listen. And over the next hour, he led them into a relationship with Jesus. And that man uh, now is a Pentecostal minister named Charlie Stoltis. Now, he t he's told that story a million times, and I've always loved to hear it. Because so often we don't recognize God's calling through the power of his Holy Spirit in everyday minor places, right? This guy's praying for this guy, not because God needs to know where he lives, because Tony apparently needed to know where he lived. And that call led to a life change for a family. Paul was a, a true apostle called by God, called that in a way that changed the world, have cha has changed the world for all of us because of the impact Paul had on the world. And I believe God is calling us as well, calling us to change the world that we live in. But we have to listen, we have to recognize his voice, we have to accept the authority and the affirmation that comes with listening to God's call and be willing to go. Let's pray.